Good morning, fellow gardeners. Welcome to Garden America. We are back in the saddle, ready to go for the weekend. We trust you had a good week, and we enter the weekend here with your friends on Garden America. <laughs> Stop it, John. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Little inside joke here with my uh, my laptop and my uh, the audio that I fail to turn off every week. Along with Tiger Palafox, I'm Brian Maine, who never remembers to turn off his laptop. John Bagnasco, our uh, resident Rosarian, and many other things, John, that we call you behind your back. How are good you? Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> good to be here. The weather's been great. You know, we just went from May gray right into June gloom. Right into June gloom, yeah. And, and, and it's, not, uh, it's not totally hot yet. I would give it another month before we're really into the summer sweltering season. Yeah, the June gloom, uh, at least in Fallbrook, starts out with cloudy mornings, but then sunny afternoons. Is that the same by you? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. And if, if you're on the beach, though, you barely see any sun at all. Really? You may see a couple of hours, and then it gets cloudy again. The further inland, the more sun. Things are so expensive on the beach now. If you're there, you can buy your own sun. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So we trust that you had a good week. We are back. Today we're going to be talking about mosquitoes with a good friend of the show. Um, is it Randy Schultz, uh, Tiger, or his counterpart on today's show? No. Bill Stengel. Bill Stengel, thank you. Bill Stengel. And, and Tiger's just got a big smile on his face here, um, <laughs> trying to get things organized. Yes, uh, you may notice that we did uh, go live a couple of two or three times before the actual start of the show to test uh, some of the audio, some of the video, which we continue to work on as we've expanded the technology in the studio. John. Hey, Tanya in San Jose says that they're expecting rain tomorrow. San Jose rain. That's Sometimes the rain does move south. Yeah, but does that bode well for us? Well, I don't know about boating, but um, <laughs> <laughs> unless you're close to the water. But the, the uh, June, you don't usually think of rain showers in June, do you? Yeah, now and then. I, I don't think it's, it's something that, that we can expect every year. But California's you know. supposed to be in a drought, and we're having rain showers yeah, in exactly, June. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I don't now, know. Is your closed caption on? No. i got to work on turning mine off. If you click so many things going on <laughs> in the studio. All you have to do is click where it says CC right, and then it but says it's, turn off. It's not going off, though. Uh, I've had that happen before. There we go. We are good to go. Uh, anyway, uh, Tiger's going to join the show when he's uh, – you, oh, you're ready to join us? I'm ready to go Are now. we good? Are Thank we okay you now? Much. Yeah, everything's good. I was sorry, just doing a lot of typing and stuff for the uh, no, post and all no, that. No, that's fine. Just so, yeah, so the yeah. – the, uh, the graphics that you see on your uh, Facebook screen, on your computer screen, a tiger does that. Usually it talks about the show, talks about the upcoming guest. And during the interview, you put a picture of our guest up there on the computer screen. Exactly. And so, um, yeah, no, Bill Stingle, we're going to be talking mosquitoes, mosquito bits, right? mosquito dunks. How to control mosquitoes. You know, people say, how do, I, how do I get rid of mosquitoes? I don't know that you can get rid of them. You can control them, right? I don't know. Back in the day, John, there was a lot of products that got rid of mosquitoes. Well, I right? wrote an article <laughs> about that yeah, for the right. newsletter. Agent, for long, Agent Orange. <laughs> <laughs> when they oh, yeah. Just, right, exactly. You know. Well, what was it that they used to actually fly over communities and, like, spray stuff, right? That, that, that was um, DEET? Uh, yes. It begins was it with DEET? A D. Help, me, help me, John. Hey, well, it's, you want me to spell it for you? <laughs> DDT. <laughs> DDT, that's <laughs> right. But DDT stands for. <laughs> Good one. Come on, John. I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> I'm I'm not going to Google that for you. I'm not going to Google. Yeah, DDT. They would just yeah, spray they would it just, everywhere. They I think they spray. still do use DDT in parts of the world. Right. Yeah. Yeah. DDT was very effective. And matter of fact, when I first started in the nursery retail nursery business, uh, we had bottles of DDT on the shelves. Yeah. Yeah. Lead arsenate. <laughs> I remember as a, a lot kid, of really oh, effective chemicals. When I was a kid exactly. in our garage, we had these. Uh, I, I guess they were for plants. But who knows? But these these dark brown bottles yeah. you could barely see through. Yeah. All I saw Glass. was a skull and crossbones on it. Yeah. Do you know why they had? They were in dark brown bottles. Something to do with keeping the sunlight out or keeping right, it so that the chemical didn't degrade. Right. Right. The DDT was really effective, but the problem with it was that it would persist in the environment for about. 50 to 60 years after it was used. It wasn't effective for that time, but it was still there. Still and there. Still there. human beings would store DDT in their fat. Yep. So wow. it got to a point where... Uh, it, 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 it was like the, it's like the mercury in fish thing. 
right. where because we were kind of the top of the food chain, right. we were the ones that were getting the most of it right. Right. kind of a thing. You know, they, we would get it from the plants we would eat. We would get it from the animals we would eat. And then we would then ourselves. And also the thermometers up. you'd break. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, milk used to be uh, regulated. And back in the 60s, it wasn't allowed to have any uh, DDT in it. If it had DDT, you couldn't sell it. Well, pretty soon there was no milk with DDT, so they set a limit to the amount that it could have, <laughs> and they kept raising the limit. The limit. And finally they said, we're not going to check anymore. Yeah. <laughs> we're done checking. Right. <laughs> that was right around the time Rachel Carson came out with her book, Silent Spring. Right, right. So, yeah, there's a lot of effective things to kill mosquitoes if you want to get rid of them. Right, but, but you want to control them. If, yeah, yeah. And, and that would also take care of every other living <laughs> object. And we're going to talk about how safe it is to uh, control mosquitoes uh, with yeah. our guest today. Yeah, because, you know, mosquito dunks and mosquito bit are very safe, that they use them in, you know, community bodies of water where they've got fish and birds and other things. Um, and it really only affects mosquitoes and other, you know, pesty bugs like that because people want to know stage. hey if it's standing water yeah. and i have you know birds or other animals that want to drink out of it are mosquito dunks safe and and they are safe yeah well yeah. tiger mentions uh was mentioning the aerial spraying for mosquitoes mm -hmm. right which right. obviously we don't do anymore <laughs> but when i was in cuba they were they had uh trucks going down the street fogging yeah fogging like crazy with little kids running behind the trucks <laughs> All this, I I oh. have no idea what they were using, but yeah. Uh, yeah, it was kind of scary. Not good. Hey, we have a listener that wants to know about uh, food scraps and if they are good for plants. Yeah, I mean, if they're uh, compost, compost them down. Right. Yeah. Uh, the best thing to do would be to mix them with the soil. If you're, you know, like banana peels. Yeah. If you uh, you can put those right in the ground around your rose bushes. You know, things like that. We've talked about composting in the past, and one of the best ways to compost, I mean, easiest for homeowners is if you have a yard, is just dig a big hole and then just begin to fill it. And then when it gets full, kind of like a landfill, just cover it up right. with some mulch, let it sit. Build okay. a house on it. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> dig another hole, start to fill that one in. You know, and then, you know, months later, if you want to harvest that right. old hole, that's really broken down, really good stuff. Now, the other what thing about planting in it, could you, you could do that? You, just yeah, plant just right plant in directly it? into it. But the um, you mentioned composting, and it's because things like tomato, squash, melons, those seeds germinate really easily. Uh -huh. And so, if you use that compost and out in your garden, you're gonna have random volunteers of tomatoes uh -huh. and all these other vegetables. So you do have to be careful. And and but that goes along with weeds because a lot of people will take weeds, throw them in their compost pile. And if they don't break them down well enough, those weeds will just come out wherever you spread that compost. Isn't the, doesn't it heat up hot enough to kill the seeds? It, if you do your compost pile well. But that's right. why I'm saying the easiest way is to do it in a hole because a lot of people do these bins. And in order to do the bin, you have to have that right mix of, of brown versus green and water to really get those temperatures up in the bins to break down the seed matter. And a lot of people will see a compost bin, those tumbler ones, and they'll the material will break down, but it doesn't actually sterilize it or compost it. So, Hey, our friend uh, from the San Diego Botanic Garden, John Clements, hey, good morning, John. says Hello, good morning. John. Uh, and I read a post by him that I, I, I like it because John will post a lot of historical information about San Diego yeah, in gardening. Uh -huh. And something I learned this week was in the 20s and 30s, I think I have the time frame right, that Carlsbad was known as the avocado capital of the world. Not Fallbrook? No, but Carlsbad? Carlsbad. Really? So then it moved north to Fallbrook later on. East. East, northeast, right? Right. Is is Carl a little bit north. directly? Yeah, is north. It direct, is it north also? A little bit. Northeast, yeah, hey a little John, bit. John, we got to get to your quote of the week. We're going to okay. take a break coming up here in just a very few. Tiger will uh, connect with our guest. Uh, lots going on here on this uh, Saturday morning here as uh, we scramble to bring you the best programming possible, not only on uh, Facebook Live, but also BizTalk Radio as well. John? Okay, today's quote is from Christine Todd Whitman. Ah. 
Uh, Chris Whitman. <laughs> Christy Whitman. She was a uh, the former governor of New Jersey. Mm -hmm. I mean, year, and by former, I mean by many years. Uh, but uh, tried to get that quote to go with today's uh, theme, which is mosquitoes. Mosquitoes, yep. And she said, anyone who thinks that they're too small to make a difference has never tried to fall asleep with a mosquito in the room. Great quote. Great quote. Okay, that said, we are going to take a break and uh, come back with our guest. Uh, those on Facebook Live, of course, uh, questions, comments right there in the chat column. Those on BizTalk Radio, you can tune in every Saturday morning live, 11.06 Eastern Time Zone, 8.06 on the West Coast Pacific Time, and to join us live. This is Garden America, back after these messages on BizTalk Radio. Welcome back to Garden America. Those on uh, BizTalk Radio, thank you so much for being right there. Those on Facebook Live, we appreciate you tuning in and watching us uh, each and every Saturday morning, as time permits. Uh, that said, we got the quote of the week out of the way. We got our early business, our monologue out of the way. So with that in mind, that in tow, I'm going to turn it over to Tiger Palafox to bring in our guest. And today, we're going to be talking about those pesty, blood-sucking mosquitoes, Tiger. <laughs> this morning... We have our uh, a favorite mosquito guest on the program with us, Bill Stingle with Summit Chemicals. Um, Summit creates a number of products, but two of their um, probably most popular products are the Mosquito Dunks and Mosquito Bits. Bill, welcome to the show. Good morning. Hey, good morning, guys. How, how's everything going where you're at? Oh, it's beautiful. It's just such a gorgeous day here on the East Coast. It's uh Right now it's in the mid-70s, going to climb to low 80s, not a cloud in the sky. It's just a simply gorgeous day. Oh, that's spectacular, man. That's right? Better. I think it's better than our weather over here in San Diego right now. <laughs> hey, so, um, so, Bill, we're getting into mosquito season, and we had a, a listener um, right now mention on the program um, mosquitoes getting one of those um, – what are they? Maybe infrared, black light, bug zappers. Yeah, bug zappers, yeah. Um, now, you know, we don't always recommend those because they don't discriminate against bugs. Um, you know, what are your feelings on on the bug zappers? Well, I, I agree. Not only do they not discriminate, but there's been a number of studies done. Just uh, people, you know, scientists, putting bug zappers out and measuring the contents of what's in and around the bug zapper and it's highly unlikely that you'll find a mosquito because mosquitoes aren't attracted to ultraviolet light. Yeah, yeah. And so, so, so for the lot. most part, you know, those bug zappers are getting uh, moths and um, some other night insects that are actually beneficial. They're, in many cases, they're pollinators. Yeah, I was going to say moths are one of the big nighttime pollinators, right? Yes. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, and I know that they sell some of those bug zappers with a. Uh, uh, an additive or an essence sometimes that they'll say will attract the mosquitoes to it. But like you're saying, they might get attracted to it, but they're not necessarily attracted to the light, so therefore they don't always get zapped. So, you know, the population that gets zapped is usually those 
nighttime bugs that are attracted to the light, which are actually probably more beneficial bugs than uh, harmful bugs. Yeah, I think if oh, you put a little absolutely. vial of blood in there, yeah, that that would attract the mosquitoes <laughs> yeah. and vampires. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, but but Bill, you you guys have a, a few products that actually are proven to work on on minimizing the mosquito population by starting at the larva state, correct? That's correct. Yeah, so and, let's, um, let's start off with but, mosquito but, dunks. I'm sorry? Uh, start off by describing the mosquito dunk first. Well, the mosquito dunk, uh, it looks like a, almost a little white donut. I mean, it even has a hole in the center like a donut does. And um, you, you drop the dunk in standing water because standing water is where mosquitoes breed. They don't breed anywhere else. They need water. Um, the female drops the eggs in the water and they go through the different life stages until they finally emerge as an adult, but they must have water to be able to survive. Okay. So they have so to you, have that standing water in order to repopulate. Exactly. So the mosquito dunk kills the larval stage of mosquitoes uh, the mosquito dunk is a bacteria, not a chemical, and it's a naturally occurring bacteria. It's actually a soil-borne bacteria that was discovered in Israel about 40 or 50 years ago. Okay. And it was discovered by a scientist that was doing mosquito research, and he, he saw two ponds close to each other, and one pond was brimming with mosquito larvae, and the other pond was completely void of mosquito larvae. So in his research, he found that it was this bacteria that was ingested by the mosquito larva, and they couldn't survive, whereas in the other pond without that bacteria, they did survive. Mm. And consequently, you know, it discovered how to reproduce the bacteria, and we turned it into a product that... Um, is a sustained release product. So mosquito dunks, it's not just a one and done. You put it in the standing water and it continues releasing bacteria for 30, 40 days or more. Okay. And um, in terms of using the mosquito dunk, I mean, you could use these on bird baths, ponds, um, even if you have areas where you just know, maybe, maybe you have mm -hmm. a, a roof and water maybe you have heavy dew situations where you just have these uh, areas where water just becomes stagnant and stays and you can't always get rid of it you can use it in all of those environments right oh absolutely um and, and oftentimes we hear from people well we don't have any standing water on our property and but we have mosquitoes so there must be standing water around somewhere and if you're absolutely sure that you don't have it then your neighbors have it so um, you need to get with your neighbors too but areas of standing water that people don't even think of because they don't look up for instance they look up at their roof and there's those nice gutters up there but if those gutters are just the slightest bit clogged it turns into a mosquito condominium <laughs> Yeah, so you got definitely got to go a good inspection around your property. Hey, hey I, I would imagine, too, that when you talk about standing water, it could be just a very, very little bit, even maybe sometimes hard to see. Uh, would, would that be the case when people say, well, we don't have standing water? Could it be very small? Oh, definitely. Uh, some mosquitoes need as little as a thimble full of water to pre reproduce. So <laughs> yeah, some of the areas that I like to tell people to look is, hey, if you have trees on your property, look and see – if there's a, an area in the crotch of the tree that collects water, or is there a tree hole that collects water, or is there um, just at the base of the tree, is there a, an indentation that is you know, shady enough and deep enough that water can last for a week or longer? Uh, if, if you have an irrigation system, if you have a sprinkler system, you probably have a sprinkler box that fills up with water. Uh, I mean, you don't even think about it, but it, it's there, and the mosquitoes find it. I was um, thinking if you have uh, plants in pots and you have saucers under them, yeah. you know, the water that's in a saucer could probably be enough for mosquito larvae. Well, it can, and, and not only that, but so many people these days are using a self-watering planter, and self-watering planters have an irrigation system, a reservoir in the bottom, uh, and typically have a fill tube somewhere up near the top. And, yeah, that's a, a prime area for mosquitoes. So just simply 
breaking off a piece of mosquito dunk. You don't have to use the whole thing, just uh, break it into chunks and fill those reservoirs. Yeah. Hey, Bill, I had just a quick question. I was wondering. Less less than a minute, John. Go ahead. Okay, well, he can answer this when he comes back. But Tiger was talking about bird baths. And my question is, if you put a mosquito dunk in the bird bath, uh, do you just keep adding water um, as the water evaporates? And will it still be effective when we get back from the break? You can let us know about that. Okay, thank you. And again, we will do that. I'm noticing a lot of questions here about fountains and other areas where there could be standing water. But as Bill mentioned, uh, just a little bit could attract mosquitoes. So we'll take a break uh, right here on Facebook Live and, of course, Biz Talk Radio. Come back with your questions. I did see some non-related questions early on in the show on Facebook. If we fail to get to those questions, feel free to repost your question after we're done with our interview with Bill talking about mosquitoes and mosquito dunks. It is Garden America. I'm Brian Maine, John Bagnasco, Tiger Palafox, stepping aside for these messages on Biz Talk Radio. Alrighty, we are back, uh, back from the break, that is. Those on Biz Talk Radio, thank you so much for supporting our many sponsors. Back with the Facebook Live, we're talking about mosquitoes this morning. Tiger Palafox, John Bagnasco, Brian Maine. Learning a lot so far, and again, this has sparked uh, quite a bit of interest on the Facebook, Tiger. Yeah, and uh, before the break, uh, John had asked the question about if you have a bird bath, they evaporate real quickly, and the birds right. use that water. And right. do you need to keep adding a dunk? or a bit of a mosquito dunk, or can you add, like, one, and then that's good for a period of time? So what are your thoughts on that, Bill? Okay, so with with bird baths, um, oftentimes you don't need a mosquito dunk or anything else because the water evaporates so quickly, or or you change the water out, or you just get a hose and, you know, flush the old water out and put new water in. so if you're doing that on a regular basis, you don't have to worry about it because mosquitoes need, depending on the temperature, depending on the weather, you know, they need four to seven days to, to reproduce. So if you're washing that out frequently, you don't have to worry about a, a mosquito dunk. Okay. But if, but if you have a, a, a deeper bird bath that's in a shady area, you're not getting a lot of evaporation, um, sure, put a piece of dunk in there just for peace of mind. And if it does completely dry out and then you put water back in, uh, when it dries out, basically the dunk goes into stasis. I mean, it just stops um, spreading bacteria because uh-huh. there's no water left. But as soon as you fill it back up again, it'll continue doing its job. Okay. Hey, John, we got a couple of mosquito questions on Facebook. Did you see those? Well, Lenore wants to know, uh, and Bill just alluded to this a little bit, but how long does it take to go from to get a live mosquito or a mature for mosquito from the larva stage? Yeah, and it, and it depends on the variety of mosquito. It depends on the environmental conditions. Um, but, but generally anywhere from four days to two weeks. Okay. So anywhere that you have standing water and you're allowing that standing water to sit for more than four days, you de- you need to be either using dunks or you need to be emptying it out, letting it dry out between. Now, now we'll like say we we, we mentioned um, saucers for for potted plants, and a lot of times people will water their plants. That saucer will get filled up, and they might not water again for a week or so, and that saucer dries out after two or three days um but it was wet for two or three days and they a mosquito came and dropped its eggs in there now when that saucer gets resaturated are those eggs still there and able to kind of come back if that saucer stays wet for longer than a week or okay so 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 if the eggs have already been submerged in water and they dry out they're gonna die oh okay but 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 interestingly enough there are mosquitoes uh, different varieties that that lay eggs uh, in areas that are currently dry. Um, you know, they yeah yeah instinctively know that at some point in time that area is going to fill up with water. And then, I mean, these eggs can be there for months and months, and and nothing happens. And then it gets water, and then all of a sudden it uh, they get uh, covered with water, and it 
generates that that life cycle it starts yeah. happening yeah i mean that's that was my thing is it's kind of, i mean this is gross but it's kind of like maggots where they're there <laughs> you know yeah how did they get there i don't know but they're there but, and, yeah. <laughs> but all it takes is a little bit of an activation yeah and, and there they come in. and they come and, to life and that's mosquitoes because you could be having no mosquitoes in your backyard right for a long period of time and then all of a sudden you go out one day and you're they're there, and, and they're there in force. And I'm like, where did these come from? So yes. they just yeah. So Bill, is it safe to say, like what Tiger's talking about, that they could be right there, we just don't see them, and then something happens to activate them? Oh, sure, absolutely. Yeah. So guy, and so 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 this would be good for you know people that have uh, those wet areas that, like you just said, seasonally become wet. Maybe maybe they're uh, increasing their irrigation in their lawns or their yards, and you know, normally it was drying out for the past few months, and now they've increased it, and so now it's staying wet. That's where some of these mosquitoes anticipate laying their eggs, and now that's where the problem is going to come, right? Correct. Yeah, that's 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 pretty intelligent of those mosquitoes. Um, are we caught up on the questions, John? We got one from. Did you see the one from uh, from John? Yes. Yeah, John wants to know. He, uh, Bill, what do you think about programs to release sterile male mosquitoes as a way to control mosquitoes? He's said he's heard different reports about the success of these programs. And he also wants to know when they do that, are the mo mosquitoes genetically modified to get them to be sterile? Um, uh, well, honestly, I, I've been following this a little bit. I can't say that I'm completely up to speed on it. Uh, I mean, to me, I guess it sounds like a, a, a good idea. And, you know, in, in terms of are they genetically modified, I would think they would have to be in in some manner, but but again, I, I really can't answer right. that because I'm I, I haven't been following it that closely. Yeah, I think they're made sterile through radiation. Yeah, I think they're. And and uh, yeah. one of the main problems, because uh, I followed this a little bit too, one of the main problems with releasing um, males that have been made sterile through radiation is that they're sometimes weaker than males who have not undergone the radiation. So because of that, they don't compete as much as regular uh, well, hardy males would. And if we've learned anything from Spider-Man and any other comic book, that anything Jurassic with Park. radiation, <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, it, it's, Jurassic it's never going to end well, yeah. right? <laughs> hey, um, hey, Bill, to kind of change subjects a little bit um, from the mosquito dunks now, you, you guys also have mosquito bits, which are a, a kind of different form of the dunk, but those bits are also geared towards other things besides mosquitoes. And one of the big problems that people have for their indoor house plants or just their potted plants are those little pesky gnats that are in the soil, right? Correct. So how is it that somebody can use the bits to control that? So the bacteria that we talked about earlier it's it's called bti or it's referred to as bti the cellus thuringiensis is raleensis so guys say that five times real fast <laughs> um it, it's it, it's not species specific but it is a class of insect specific so that class of insect is called diptera and mosquitoes belong to that class Black flies belong to that class, and fungus gnats belong to that class. So fungus gnats are actually related, very closely related to mosquitoes, though they don't bite. So, I mean, that's that's one of the real joys. I mean, a fungus gnat is annoying. I mean, you'll see a cloud of them. You can see a cloud of them around your house plants, and the fungus gnat larva can feed. They typically feed on decaying organic material in your potting soil, but they can also feed on the little rootlets of the plants. Mm. So they're an annoyance more than anything else, and people like to get rid of them. Oftentimes in the home, there's some uh, reluctance to, to treat plants with, with chemicals if you've got you know, dogs or cats or kids, and, and you're just worried about doing that. So that, that's a nice thing about mosquito bits, using that for fungus gnat control is um, there is no downside except unless you're a fungus gnat. <laughs> and how is it that people would use? They just drop these bits into the top of the soil? Um, uh, well, uh, our recommendation, is, we used to 
have a recommendation where you just spread it over the top of the soil and water it in. And mosquito bits are actually a corn cob granule. We use corn cob as the carrier to hold the bacteria. And we found that people doing that, oftentimes if they just left that corn cob on top of their soil, it would get a little moldy or a little mm. funky looking and it just you know, wasn't pleasant to view. So um, we came back and said, okay, let's stop doing that. Let's, let's do something that's not gonna be detrimental to the look of the plant. And we recommend that, that people make a tea by putting a tablespoon per quart of water, stir it up, uh, let it sit for 15, 20 minutes, and then use that to water your plants. And the bacteria is it's almost microscopic, and it, it washes down into the soil, which is where you want it to go anyway because the fungus gnats are down throughout the soil. And uh, yep. once they ingest this liquid that you're using as water, um, then, then they die. Yeah, perfect. Great way to use it. Hey, Bill, we're going to have to take another break right now. When we get back, I want to talk about some of the other products you guys have because aside from these uh, mosquito things, we got flea and tick issues and stuff like that. We're getting in the summer months. A lot yep. of things to think about. All right? Okay, do stay with us. Uh, back with Bill after these messages on BizTalk Radio. Glad uh, you could join us on this Saturday. Happy weekend. John Bagnasco. I'm Brian Main, Tiger Palafox. Those on Facebook Live, of course, remember to keep on the chat. We'll get to as many questions as possible after the interview. Perhaps circle back with other non-related mosquito questions. Back after these messages. Welcome to Garden America. These messages, I should say, on BizTalk Radio. Stay with us. All righty, we are back. Uh, those on BizTalk Radio, this is the final segment of hour number one. You've got news coming up top of the hour. Then we return at six minutes after. Hopefully your market does carry both hours of uh, Garden America, at least one hour, two hours. We do appreciate that. Back on Facebook Live, talking about mosquitoes with Bill. Lots of questions still to come, Tiger. Let's keep on rolling. Yeah, there, there was an interesting question that came across before we move on. Um, and it's I'd almost lead it, Bill, with... Um, is there ever a situation where you wouldn't want to use uh, mosquito dunks or bits? And the reason why is we have a listener that asked about their swamp cooler. And um, if you're familiar with the swamp cooler, it's basically an air conditioner, and it uses a large amount of water to blow the air through. Um, but the swamp coolers have, I would say, open sources for water, like meaning they're open to the outside environment, unlike an air conditioner, which is a closed system swamp coolers are open and so when it's not running it does have little ponds of water but then it starts to run and it moves so do do you think people are going to have mosquito issues with their swamp cooler and then the next thing is would that be safe to use in a swamp cooler where um, they're potentially uh, putting that bacteria into the air okay so the the short answer is it, it would still be safe to use mm -hmm. but uh, uh, with a swamp cooler, unless it's going to be sitting unused with water in it for a period of time, I would say it would be unnecessary to, to use a dunk or anything else in it. And then is is, uh, is it is, are these products pretty much safe to use? You know, I mean, let, let me let me say like this, like maybe um, uh, in the sense of uh, I'd be worried about kids in a body of water, like maybe my kids uh, little swimming pool. You know, it's, it's sitting in the backyard. I don't want to fill it up every time my kid plays in it or dump it out and I put a bit in there or something like that. Is it safe for people to be in that body of water? No problems there? Uh, no problems there. Uh, it, it, it's interesting that people look at our product, they'll look at the package and they'll, they'll read the label and there's all types of warnings on oh, the yeah. label. And they'll call us and go, I thought this product was safe. <laughs> and unfortunately, or fortunately as the case may be, when you deal with an EPA-registered insecticide, and this is an EPA-registered insecticide um, because 
it's made of a product that's not a food grade material there are insecticides out in the marketplace that you can buy and you don't have to prove any kind of efficacy you don't have to prove that they work um, you just have to prove that they're safe and if it's a food grade ingredient then it's classified as safe by the EPA and they don't require any kind of registration or efficacy you know, with ours because it's not a food grade you have to go through e efficacy testing and review and uh, and then you know they finally give it the okay but every single product that's EPA registered must go through a laundry list of um, you know wear gloves do not get it on your hands <laughs> wash your hands right yeah, after you're finished and on and on yeah, and on yeah. but but that's that's a boilerplate everybody has to do it yeah. if you look at the EPA website under mosquito control um, you'll find a picture of a dunk there and they'll talk about the active ingredient BTI and how basically safe it is to use we can't by law, because again, it's an EPA registered insecticide, we can't say on our label that it's safe. But if you read the EPA website with BPI, you'll draw that conclusion. Okay. Yeah, Good that makes know. sense. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, if you watch commercials on television for any kind of pharmaceuticals, and then listen to the dis or <laughs> disclaimer. Yeah. It's like, right. why would I use this? It's going to cause diarrhea, hemorrhaging, yeah. uh, and possible death. Yeah, the side yeah. effects <laughs> seem worse than the problem that you're right, experiencing. Exactly. Yeah, no, no question. Right, so that does make, make total sense, Bill. Hey, Bill, another big problem this time of year, and mostly people with um, uh, big areas of uh, weeds or wooded lands, and they have pets, are flea and tick. Um, and you guys have a product also that people can use in their yard for that as well, right? We do. Um, it's, it's our tick and flea spray. And, you know, we call it tick and flea as opposed to flea and tick because our real focus is on tick. Ah. And this product is, is great for ticks. It's uh, one of two synthetic pyrethroids that are really recommended for tick control. Not, not all insecticides, not all backyard insecticides work on ticks well you know some are pretty mediocre but this one is a really good product for ticks okay and how 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 would you recommend because i mean most ticks are going to be i would say in uh, meadows you know that's the biggest thing people talk about oh whenever you walk through a uh, a meadow you know there's an opportunity for a tick to latch onto your dog or get onto your leg oh or, yeah oh, or, de oh definitely and so how would you use this product you just spray it over a large area or, or how do it, you use it, that it, you do so in, in a typical residential area if you're keeping your grass cut nice and short um you know, in your yard area you're not going to have an issue with ticks right but if you have bordering property that that may be wooded that's where you really have an issue with ticks or if you have an area with shrubbery that that circles your yard so shrubbery is going to provide shade it's going to provide areas for ticks to climb ticks can't stand being in the heat and sun uh, they need shade and humidity in order to survive so that's why you'll never really find a tick out in the middle of a a well-mown lawn but yes out in the meadows out in the woods out in those areas so so in the case of a homeowner here, um, if, if they're worried about ticks, we would suggest treating the perimeter. They're, it's really just a waste of the insecticide to treat your whole yard. Okay, good. Well, um, lots of great info. Bill, thank you very much for joining us this weekend. SummitChemical.com is the website where you guys have all your products listed. And again, more than just the ones that we even mentioned, I mean, you know, deer products, other pond solutions for algae and things like that. Um, you can find your find the products online, also at your local garden center. Um, thank you very much for joining us, Bill, and I hope you have a great rest of the weekend. Guys, it's always a pleasure, and with the weather like today, I know I'm going to have a great weekend. <laughs> yeah, all right. Don't get bit. <laughs> yeah. Thank all you. Right. Take care. Take care. Bill. You got right. it. Thank you, Bill. John, did we cover uh, most of the mosquito questions that you see on we Facebook? Did, uh, Dana had a question, though, on 
uh, blood types that were that oh, the yeah. mosquitoes might be more attracted and to. And is it only the female mosquitoes who bite? That's that's, that's true. Only females right. bite. And, and that's uh, true in life in general, right? <laughs> And the blood type that they are most attracted to is blood type O. O blood, which is a universal, oh, I'm sorry, O negative is the universal blood type. that You can donate blood to anybody. Universal donor. Universal donor. Hey, yeah. that, that's it. Thank you, John. We are going to take a break. We've got news coming up top of the hour. Biz Talk Radio. Got, got to stay in time for the network. And then we are back uh, quickly here on Facebook Live. Garden America for your weekend. I'm Brian Maine. John Bagnasco, Tiger Palafox. Again, news on Biz Talk Radio. Back after these messages as well. Stay with us. just like that uh, we are back if you are tuned in on biz talk radio this is the start of hour number two and about six minutes after those on facebook live thank you for joining us i'm brian main we've got john bagnasco tiger palafox the usual suspects here on garden america thank you for joining us each and every weekend supporting our show we've got a uh, youtube channel garden america radio show you can watch this show this afternoon and all of the other shows that are it guy daniel archives and be sure to go to our website GardenAmerica.com. Again, that's GardenAmerica.com, our website. Check it out. Tiger, what's happening now as, as far as uh, learning about mosquitoes? Do you have standing water in your uh, backyard? I do. And, you know, it's kind of one of those situations like Bill mentioned where I, I do feel I do a good job of checking things out, making sure to empty areas, you know, not having it. But um, we still have mosquitoes. And so it is a challenge. Maybe my neighbors, maybe I do have some small areas um, because I do border up to a canyon. And, and I'm almost wondering, I know we've talked to Bill before, and they, they, it has to be pretty close to your property where you have the standing body of water. But in my canyon, I have a creek that runs through it. And obviously at this point in time, that creek. you got creek, a creek? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, at this point in time, that creek is not running <laughs> yeah, if you were down south, it would be a crick. Right? <laughs> crick. Crick, yeah. So I, I'm almost thinking they come up out of the canyon. Could be, yeah. And then into my property Now, as Dana well. had a question about fountains. If You know, when you turn your fountain off, you have the standing water. Right. But Bill addressed that saying that any standing water for four days or more. That's the problem, right? right? right. What you would have in a fountain, right, if you turned it off Well, here's the days. thing. Here's the thing. We, t we run it once a day. Yeah. It's oh. always running. Now, we are leaving, you know, middle of this month for about four or five days. So I'm just going to empty the water. Yeah, you just there'll drain be, it. There'll it be down. no water in there. When I come back, I'll refill it. You could leave it full of water and put mosquito fish in it. I, I or could do that. mosquito dunks. Or mosquito dunks, sure. And they oh, won't hurt the birds either. Yeah. You get a lot of birds that come by and take a bath every day. In that yeah. Mountain. yeah they I, love I mean, this this week you posted about your birds that are have hatched. They, they hatched. look like they're healthy. They look you know, good. Up there. Doves uh, have uh, usually lay two eggs. Yeah. So they're they're right on schedule in terms of uh, what they're supposed to be doing. You you, you check their weights and the, the male and female take turns fly off getting food. I don't know where the one stays at night. Probably somewhere close nearby. But that picture that I took on Facebook, I was telling you guys before the show, that's a lot of trust. First yeah. of all, trusting to be in the patio with us, and then leaving the nest with your two little chicklets or your two little birds in there. Yeah. Without supervision. Yep. It says they can trust us as well. Now, I did sneak a picture. Do so they still make chicklets? The do. gum? Yeah. Yeah, they yes, do. They do. do they? Isn't that, that's and a they still sell them at the border. At the border, <laughs> yeah. Chicklets? Chicklets, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Hey, Connie wants, says she has a few roses and two tomatoes where the leaves have suddenly turned yellow. Ah. She wants to know if it's nutrients and what would be the best to add. I don't think you're the right person to answer this question, John, but go ahead. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I... Tiger, see if you agree with this. I would say if leaves suddenly turn yellow, it's probably not nutrients. Right. Because it would gradually that would be a gra yeah. turn yellow. If it happens overall. Right. If the leaves turn yellow quickly, it's from something else, and it's usually environmental. Uh, could be that the plant dried out. 
um, could be maybe some type of uh, disease. Yeah, wilt, the, the different wilt. You know, right, she tomatoes. mentions on her tomatoes that uh, two died suddenly, and she said they're not the same types as the ones that are doing well. So it's possible that the two tomatoes that died were not resistant to fusarium uh, uh, blight or verticillium wilt, mm -hmm. which is in the soil, and could be the other varieties were resistant. So, so that's a possibility. Yeah, and with the with the tomatoes as well, um, you know, one other thing that happens this time of year is overwatering, which you know, again, with those issues of wilt and things like that, sometimes people will mistake overwatering by underwatering or for underwatering, and then they water more, which creates a problem. But usually, that's an overall yellowing that will occur but you do have some areas of the tomato that will will be affected more from overwatering than others and and I found this especially true in containers because one of the weird things about tomatoes in containers is that container can sometimes hold more water in certain parts and that root system affected in those you know because each branch of your tomato each section of your tomato is supported by different sections of the roots and um, sometimes those areas will rot a bit quicker or more than other areas. So I've seen that happen. Um, on the yellowing with the rose, John, I have a few planted in the ground. And sometimes just the lower leaves will get yellow. And that's not so much of a concern, right? When it's just the lower part of it, but the top of the leaves are healthy and green. Yeah, you know, you think of... Uh deciduous versus evergreen plants yeah and evergreen plants well they're evergreen <laughs> it's not the same green the uh, for instance if you have a conifer the needles that are inside the tree will fall off it's the mm -hmm. needles on the outside that get the sun that stay green yeah. so the same thing with roses uh, as the leaves get older they eventually fall on deciduous trees um, as some of them get older, they'll fall, but they all fall at the... Yeah. I, I think you bring up a good in, point, in though, the that autumn. anything that happens almost immediately or suddenly in the garden, that's a problem. Mm -hmm. That's like you, you have a what, disease or critter, something's going on in there. Anything gradual is probably, for the most part, a more natural more occurrence. Natural, yeah. 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 But, yeah, so uh, I hope that answered your question a little bit, maybe gave her a little bit of insight of what's happening in the garden for sure. Got a drip system question for you, Tiger. Oh, you read it, please? From Rick. Putting in a new drip system for my new raised beds. Think I will run the water lines overhead. Uh, try tying the tomatoes right to the line. What do you think of that? Um, and that's from Rick. The only concern that I have with that is with drip systems and when you put the drippers right at the base of the plant, you sometimes make the, the plants more susceptible to a, a, a rot, a, a basal too, rot. Too much water? Right at the base of the plant. You know, the, uh, I mean, and, and tomatoes are a little bit different because they don't mind, you know, th we, we talk about burying them deep and they'll put roots out of their stems and all of that. But nonetheless, whenever the base of the plant, where the plant and the soil meet, stays wet, um, sometimes there's just rot that occurs. And dripper, drip systems are designed to kind of you know keep the water in that one right, spot right. and then it and if you water too frequently it never dries out so we always recommend and you you put that dripper a little bit outside of the base of the plant you know <clears throat> um you know whether it's a, a few inches away or a foot or so away depending on the plant because the water is going to get to the roots but at least it's not sitting right there at the base of the plant that would be the only concern that i have um with what rick has described that he's going to do Dale mentions that uh, there's a recall on strawberries because oh, of yeah. hepatitis A. Really? And he wants to know. Now, it's in certain states. It's not all states. Right. So he wants to know how strawberries get hepatitis A. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's usually the handling process, Dale. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, where uh, people handling them uh, are not washing their hands after going to the bathroom. <laughs> Things like that. So uh, strawberries don't contract hepatitis <laughs> A. It has to be 
passed on to them through the handling process. Yeah, and a lot of those things where, you know, you talk about salmonella, hep A, you know, these ones, like you said, it's it's being absorbed by the plant. So it's either, either able to be transferred in the soil, so the soil that goes into these farms and then into the plants, obviously, or the water, you know, could possibly be not filtered or treated properly, and then it could be absorbed by the plant as well. Or, like what John mentioned, in the actual facility that processed the, the vegetables, where in the facility there was some right. kind of a, a, a breach where, <laughs> where these diseases have now gone on to, you know. And then, but I, I have a friend that works for a, um, a big farm group. And nowadays, with their whole tracking systems of where the fruit or produce came from. They can almost pinpoint to the it. They could, like, right to the minute that it was processed through that facility. And then they can take that whole section of produce or whatever it was and be like, all right, that stuff's all got to be right. notified, go out. And then even then, after the fact, they know exactly which grocery stores they sent it to which distribution centers they sent it to so they can reach out they to can them. They can nail it down pretty quickly. The, and that's what I think. It's it's the big facilities right, are right. really good about it, where okay, you get gotta, into trouble. we got to take a break. Cargo, continue that thought <laughs> after the, the break here. This is a break for our friends on uh, BizTalk Radio. So do stay with us. So we're going to come back. Uh, questions, comments, keep them coming on our Facebook page right there, right-hand side of the chat page. And uh, after these messages from BizTalk Radio, we'll be right back here on your weekend. We're Garden America. Stay with us. All right, if you're watching us on Facebook Live, we are back. Thank you to those on Facebook who noticed a little audio problem, oscillating sound, kind of a noise in the background. Let us know if uh, we fix that problem during the break as uh, we continue our progression here in the studio with our, our many cameras and the, uh, the technical things going on around here. Thank you, Tiger. So hopefully <laughs> that will fix that, that problem and adjust the audio level just a bit as well. Do you remember where you were before the break as far as your train of thought? Yeah, well, I was talking about produce and how they've right, been able well, right. to track it nowadays. Where and, it happened. and, you know, the the downside of it is big companies can do that really well. Small companies cannot. So it's a challenge when you're dealing with those uh, smaller produce right. growers. I mean, they can um, pinpoint, like, the beginning and the end yeah. and just take that block right there. And say, hey, and this, this is, is where it happened. Exactly. And then they can nail it right away. Yep. And they're usually, they're overcautious, yeah. too. Yeah, um, sure. Like there was a recall on Jif peanut butter. And Why, because it stuck to the roof of your mouth? <laughs> <laughs> Too sticky. <laughs> and um, and I, I looked at a bottle that I had just bought, a jar that I had just bought, and it had the numbers on oh. it. Oh, really? Uh, right. But I forgot to tell my wife about it. <laughs> she used it. <laughs> and what was the recall for again? Uh, I can't remember what it was. Yeah, it's one of those things that you get and die from. <laughs> yeah. but, and I forgot to tell my wife. Yeah. Sorry, dear. Yeah. But anyway, she she continues to use it. She said, you know, well, I used it, nothing happened, so it's going to be fine. <laughs> you so. know, it's just like you, you, you uh. talk about, John, how they they um, 
they go overboard or they're, they're very careful and cautious with what they say. It's the same thing when they're cutting out skin cancer. Okay, they know the cancer or potential cancer. Yeah, right they want to make sure not they'll, to they'll go back. They'll cut out around it, you yeah. know, away from the area to make sure that they get the whole thing. Kind of a weird comparison, but that's that is a very weird. That's comparison. what we're, we're we're talking about here. As <laughs> that far is as a being overly very ca- weird comparison. Well, the doctor wants to be overly cautious. Yeah, we think we have it, but we're going to go out just a little bit more and make yeah. sure we get the whole thing. <laughs> Skin cancer, peanut butter. How about that? Huh? Perfect. Oh my goodness! Never thought we could do that. Salmonella was the thing I was trying to think of. Oh, he was an actor who got killed, right? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, God. Um, That's Salminio. Sorry. Oh, goodness. Oh, man. Um, Oh, I also wanted... The audio is much better. People are... They can hear the show now, which is nice. Yeah, it was something uh, that only Tiger could have taken care of because he's our tech guy. (laughs) But but alas, that's not what you were going to talk about. No, I was mentioning <laughs> um, I wanted to go back to the strawberry recall that we were talking about. And unless there's a new one, that recall actually was for strawberries sold from the end of March through April 25th. So I think that that's over. That's almost a month minus a few days. Right. So I'd, unless you froze, bought some during that period and froze them, uh, there, I don't think there's anything to worry about, but check your computer just to be sure. Yeah. You can oh. always Google that information. And, and with that idea, too, and this is something for home gardeners to be aware of, um, because the same way that people can get that from produce growers at home, I think people have to be even more cautious. I remember watching one time, and I won't name names, but... um. Blood meal is a common fertilizer that you can buy. Right. You know, it's, it's very common, mm-hmm. right? So there was a uh, DIYer that thought that using that blood, that blood-soaked package from meat thing packages right. would be good to just incorporate into your, your, your planting, you know, because it's blood, and it's just like blood meal. But blood meal comes from facilities that make sure there are not bad things in that blood and it's processed i think it's even cooked if i remember correctly like it's baked down right um so just enter that's why we don't recommend poultry produce right. or uh meat or blood in compost bins the because because it could potentially lead to very dangerous bacteria into that compost bin and now you put that compost into your vegetable garden where you grow lettuce, where you grow tomatoes, where you grow these things, and then those those fruits could potentially have that bacteria. We, we call that secondary kill. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, you definitely don't want to wh- – whenever you have uh, products that can carry things like salmonella, um, E. coli, you know, and they have to worry about this with – you know, this is why they don't – they say don't put dog feces and specifically cat feces in your compost bins either – is because if you don't break it down and heat it up enough, right. those can go into your plants. So be cautious of that in the home garden wow. just as much as the produce I don't think I ever do. would have thought of putting dog and cat feces in a compost anyway. Really? It just doesn't – yeah, just something tells me that's just – you don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, my good buddy Joel – Right. Uh, – is a neurologist and um, one of the top neurologists in, in San Diego – and he refuses to use blood meal or bone meal around his plants oh, really? because of mad cow disease. Oh, really? Yeah. And I've never had any problems with him, <laughs> but, you know, he's a neurologist. Yeah. And he, he should know, I, I guess, if there's any danger in doing it. Because, hmm. yeah, I'm sure they got to somehow filter out specific ones, but maybe mad cow is one that he knows can't get yeah. filtered out yeah. from the process. Perhaps, you know? yeah. I don't know if I ever told you this story because it happened about 30 years ago. Um, we were we had a little nursery in Vista that was called Growing Places. You had one? Uh, well, I the Vista did. Oh, okay, Vista, the community of Vista. Right. Okay. And I was working there. I was working oh. for environmental nurseries that uh, uh, set up this little chain of retail nurseries. So anyway. Um, this uh, one of the customers used to bring in roses occasionally to give to the cashier, and the manager had had mentioned how nice his roses were, and he said, "Oh, he says I wish you'd come over and take a look." 
He said, I have a great rose garden. And the manager was telling me the story. He said he went over there, and he said these were the best roses I had ever seen in my life. <laughs> All kinds of blooms. They were beautiful. And I said, he said, I asked him, what do you feed your roses with? <laughs> Septic water. And he <laughs> says, well, he says, uh, I actually own a funeral home. Oh, good. And when I take the fluids out of the the uh, no, bodies no i put it around the roses oh, gosh. what now that was 30 mm. years ago and mm. i'm sure that he doesn't do that <laughs> oh. anymore but those are probably the kinds of things you don't want to do yeah <laughs> that's something else i never would have thought of doing either <laughs> yeah. I, I mean some things you just uh, if you have I would to think question there it. might even be some laws against doing <laughs> that if, i don't if know you have to there think about be. it yeah. a little bit stop and start over again <laughs> stop and start about. over again <laughs> really, yeah. you get a feeling, right? Sometimes you go, should I be doing this? Yeah. There's something about this that just doesn't seem right. Yeah. Lisa wants to know if she kills snails on the fence, do they become fertilizer? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They actually have to get into the ground. <laughs> but you've got, what, calcium in the shell? Yeah, yeah, right? I know. Snails Here, are good Here's a very interesting fertilizer. question. Uh, somebody says, the studio looks different. Um, are you sitting apart because of COVID-19? No. We we didn't no. change anything through COVID-19. We're sitting in the same chairs. Um, we're sitting just as far apart as we always have. But thank you for noticing yeah, the details of the studio. I'll put a shot out right now that'll show the studio again in its entirety. Yeah. Okay. Barely there. And then and then we'll take uh, take a quick break. Yeah. So so Lenore there you go. Lenore <laughs> commented on my story and just said it was disgusting. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I agree I with you, Lenore. It was agree. disgusting. Okay, great shot. There you go, Tiger. Nice shot of the studio. Hey, that said, we're going to take a, a break here on the Biz Talk Radio and, of course, Facebook Live. Stay with us. I'm Brian Main, John Begnasco, Tiger Palafox, back after these messages on Biz Talk Radio. And again, thank you for tuning in to Garden America. And just like that, we are back uh, broadcasting live on Facebook Live. Uh, those on uh, Biz Talk Radio, this is a pre-recorded show from last week. But I can assure you, you play back the show, everything's the same. Same live, same pre-recorded. Hmm. How about that, John? That'll make your head just kind of explode there. <laughs> hey, I was thinking a little bit about the, our discussion with Bill and Summit um, in the Mosquito Dunks and Bit. And, you know, I think that the... The interesting thing is being here in California, the products that they put out, Summit, just makes sense in so many ways to us. And and I get it. We might not have the massive mosquito problem that some of the other parts of the Midwest and South oh, do. Yeah, trust me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not even, not even you know, so, so it's not on our mind as right. much. But um, it's it's I still see it being difficult to convey some of their, their messages to those people um, on the East Coast because, you know, we work with the company, you know, Fertilome. Right. And, and they sponsor the show. Yeah. And they produce a lot of products. And those killing products that they produce from their brand High Yield are, are widely sold all through the South and the Midwest. Mm -hmm. And their Natural Guard products, um, they've actually recently just discontinued. Really? Because the sales were not there. Um, and... You know, and I mean, we're talking pyrethrins, neem oil, right, right. spinosad soap, products that we know are good effective stuff. and they're Especially good. Spinosad. But, right. um, you know, those people would much rather have the other products um, in those regions. And, um, you know, I mean, I think they've done a lot of research on the new products. Now. They're not selling DEET and um, right. what's the other? Malathion. You remember? Mal you, oh, you yeah, mean, Malathion. Do you, do you mean DDT well, instead of yeah, D DDT? Um, and there's DDT is still used to, yeah. as a mosquito repellent. Right. right. Yeah. DDT and malathion right. and um, chlorine. What, what was orthene? What What was that? Was it just well, orthene is a systemic? But is it straight orthene or is it a yeah. chemical? I can't remember because orthene was a company. 
Ortho. No, You're ortho. Of ortho. Ortho was the company. Ortho, ortho was yeah. the company, right? Yeah, and so you know, you know, when you go to find those products nowadays, they find them very low dilution or very insignificant. But um, well, you know, a lot of chemicals are not available in California right. or New York, but they're available in the rest of the country. Right. Yeah. And the reason is uh, the cost of registering in those two states because they both have their own EPAs. Yeah. It's not enough that we have a national EPA. We, <laughs> state, we state a EPAs. federal EPA. We have to have a state EPA, too. And uh, I don't know if it's good or bad because some of the bureaucrac bureaucracy that's there um, is just ridiculous. It makes no sense. Yeah. Do you remember our friend George Hahn? Oh, yeah. From, yeah. Uh, Worm Gold Plus. Worm, Such and, trouble. And had Such a, trouble with his product. What a great product. It was, yeah, he was sued by the state, and he sold worm castings. Yeah. Worm one of the most yeah. beneficial products right. that you could have. For the environment. Good right. for the environment. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, back to kind of Bill mentioned it, you know, the label that they put on their product, even though it's very safe, even though it's been right. proven, even though the EPA says it's safe, the warnings, it scares people away when they see it because they're like, oh, well, I've been told this is safe to use in my pond with fish and stuff, but why is it your package says, you know, right. you'll die if you ingest it? You know? Much like the, the question we had this morning when yeah. Bill was on. Yeah. But, but again, if, and getting back to, to the, the drug comparison that John made, so let's say they test that drug on, you know, 5,000 people. One person dies. Yeah. The rest are fine. You have to have that disclaimer. But that's the hard part, too, because, you know, our, our late friend, um, Steve, Steve Scotto. Well, and um, Bruce right. would Bruce say Sasakawa. the label is the law. Right. And, and yet, you know, yeah, that label was, is the law. you know, but that's, you know, in, in Bill's situation, it's not because <laughs> he's got a very safe product. But, but the label but makes said, it go to the safe. website, read it yeah. for yourself, and, and you'll, you'll decipher exactly at the end of the day what it means and how safe the product is. Look, yeah. people want to put safe products out there. They, yeah. they don't want to cut corners because then you get in trouble. Then you're out of business. And, and even how unfair it was to, to George Hahn yeah. that he did everything yeah. right and still out of business. Yeah. Well, in Bruce's case, I don't think it could have been proven, but his doctor thought that his Parkinson's might have been caused from exposure to chemicals. Really? Uh, you know, because he was in the, the nursery for so right. such right. a long time. And, and back then it was less regulated, those oh, chemicals? Yeah. Right. Nobody... Uh, wore protective gear. No. Uh, you would spray whether the wind was blowing or not. <laughs> come back in your face. And yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, things, ha things have changed. Going I remember, I think I've told you this before, but I remember as a kid in Michigan going out to pick your own cherries. Uh-huh. And, you know, we would climb up in these trees, and it was fun because we could get to pick the cherries and put them in a in uh, bowls and then or pails and then we you know my mom would take them home wash them and, and we'd eat them but we would eat tons of them while we were in the Picking. trees ourselves and they had all been sprayed with lead arsenate <laughs> and to keep the birds from eating them yeah. you know because like, wait birds, a minute <laughs> birds wouldn't eat them you know those things are poison. <laughs> is, that, is that before the idea of putting a net over the tree Came into well, play. I mean, when you're well, dealing with orchards, yeah, over, you can't put nets over yeah. orchards. You can. You like two helicopters <laughs> with a huge, giant huge, net. giant net, and you drop them every 100 feet. Uh, yeah, I've already got it figured out. That's yeah. an idea. But, 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 but the same token, though, we did ingest a lot of things as kids, like you say, and some people are okay, some people not quite so. Yeah. Right. <laughs> well, like you say, what uh, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. It's all about that uh, old immune system going. Okay, now we, are we caught up on the questions? Um, if we missed your question on Facebook Live, just repost it uh, down at the bottom there, and we yeah, will please. certainly do our best to answer. We don't want to leave anybody out. Yeah. We don't want to leave you out. And especially this time of year when everything's starting to grow, we got tomatoes and other produce ripening, um, time to harvest stuff. Do you have any ripe tomatoes yet? No. No? no I've, got, we got a couple, I've got, got a couple small ones. Yeah, I was going to say, my small ones, I've already harvested a few. Yeah. My larger ones are... Um, I would say starting to blush, meaning they're starting to turn a little red. There's you know, a tomato I, called blush. blush. Yeah. <laughs> there, there is a because Danny was asking about our tomatoes because we have three, and I said, okay, well these are the sweet ones you're used to. So what about those? I said, not quite so sweet. She goes, well, what do they taste like? I said, more like a tomato. 
<laughs> and, and she got it. She goes, oh, yeah, more like a tomato, less sweet. Well, people who are tomato aficionados like the acid in the tomatoes. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they look for a, a balance between the acid and the sweetness. Right, right. Some people don't like, like Brian and I really like sweet tomatoes. The sweeter, the better. You right? don't like grapes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, tomato aficionados like uh, search for a balance between the two. Yeah, and especially if you're using them in terms of a slicing or in certain foods, you know, the right. sweet isn't always what you want in that food. Right. So, yeah, good, good Maybe stuff. But yeah, sauces and things. Egg, and then my eggplant is flowering. And what else do I have? Got you, oranges, lemons, no limes right now. Do no you ever avocado. plant anything that you never pick? Oh, yeah. Because when yeah. you say eggplant, that's one thing I think of. You know, we would plant eggplant every year. I, I can't remember ever picking them. See, but it only gives you a few eggplants, so I think it's one of those. I, I, I like eggplant. Uh-huh. So, eggplant but parmesan? It's, yeah, but yeah, it's, but it's only it all you need parmesan. is one. All you need is one or so. How about fried eggplant? That's good. Ooh, and we have an air fryer now. Ooh, okay, how long have you had it? Um, Under a year. Okay. I live by it. When we bought ours, we stopped using the oven. Yeah. It is. Uh, you well, can and especially for two people. Oh, it's perfect. Because you turn on the oven, it takes forever to heat up. and Steaks. French and fries. Steaks. French, French fries, fries in the oven were just never crispy nope. enough. You can't get them crispy. And then if you want to fry them, it's not healthy. Right. And the air fryer is oh, crispy. Oh, so you know, good. Until somebody comes up with something that says, oh, did you know that air fryers do this and this? <laughs> Radiation. That's how, that's how they make those sterile mosquitoes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I put them in the air, air fryer. <laughs> but, yeah, we are sold on the air fryer. Oh, just yeah. Just a great way to cook food. So, yeah, I'm excited to put my eggplant in yeah. the air fryer. It's going to be delicious. Yeah. Now, you got to read and make sure because – it, it's it's a learning experience how to cook in an air fryer. Yeah, you, yeah. you go to Google or a recipe, and then you, okay, well that was a little too well done. That wasn't quite enough. Okay, I got it. So yeah. we'll say like whatever it is, corn on the cob, six to eight minutes, and I'll say let's go seven. When you go to YouTube, there's a video for everything. everything. You know the problem is <laughs> when you want a quick answer on YouTube, uh-huh. you got somebody that wants to be a YouTube star. And they take 10 minutes before they actually get oh, to, to answering the point. your question. Right. Yeah. Well, hello there. I see that you've tuned in to learn how to put these two wires together. <laughs> yeah. You know, back in 1840, when these <laughs> wires were invented. When like, these wires were invented. Dude, that's just it. Give, give me the answer. <laughs> you know how tech savvy I am, right? Mm, absolutely. You put this studio together. Of course I do. <laughs> but, and, and virtually, I know nothing about tech. But using a YouTube video, I put a solid state drive into my computer. Oh, that's right. How I remember, remember that. that? Yeah. Well, you know why? Because instead of like Googling it and trying to follow instructions, they show you. Yeah. They point it to yeah. the various areas yeah. that you okay, need. Okay, I can unscrew this, yeah. unscrew that. Hey, we're going to take a break. Off. It's our final break of the show. One more segment to go. Uh, let's blast off with some more questions on Facebook. Plenty of time. So we're going to take a break uh, for messages uh, from our friends, our great sponsors on BizTalk Radio and then come right back on Facebook Live. Welcome to the weekend. John Bagnasco, I'm Brian Main, Tiger Palafox. This is Garden America with, again, one more segment. Well, hey there, boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, and as we say, all the little animals who are gathered around the Facebook computer and the radio <laughs> on BizTalk Radio, we've made it to our final segment of this, uh, I guess we call this a Saturday. What, what's today? The four, uh, the uh, What's the date? The 4th? Uh, 4th. Fourth. Fourth. June 4th. Fourth. June 4th. If it was year May 4th, it'd be that Star Wars day. 2022. So again, uh, still plenty of time for your questions. Actually, about six minutes left for your questions or comments I'm on gonna Facebook Live. I'm going to go home Live. and plant. 
You going to plant yourself on the couch? No, no. I, I, I told you last week I planted 100 roses yep. and a bunch of plumeria. And now I'm going to fill in some of the spaces. Uh, I have an order coming, I think, from uh, Four Winds. Fruit trees? Yeah, I ordered some. Let's see if I have it here. I ordered some citrus and avocados. Oh, fun. So Did you find your um, – what, what avocado were you looking for? I'm not surprised. You were I looking couldn't for find Nabel, Na that's but the I one. did settle on Reed. Okay. And I, I did it because Ed Livo said, oh, Reed's just as good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I thought Nabel was a bigger one. Anyway, I did get one of those, and I got a surprise. Did you get a surprise? Right. And then I got a, a pixie mandarin because you don't see pixies that often. No. Pixies they're tough to see. Then, they're <laughs> tough to see. You know, they float around they make quickly. Pixie sticks anymore? Pixie do they? haircut. <laughs> do you remember uh, being little and there was a product called Licamade? It was a little packet of um, sugary, sugar. <laughs> yeah, sugary and tart, and you would pour it in your hand. And then you would lick it with your tongue. Oh, sounds and it would color the. <laughs> yeah, color yeah, that that didn't survive COVID. Could that, could that <laughs> have been a regional thing? I, I don't. It was in Michigan, uh, so I don't know if it was no, national I think, or. I think the best marketing for candy was the uh, dip, those dip sticks or whatever they call those sticks, lick sticks, where it's a sugar stick, where you dip it in that sugar tart. Stuff. No, I never heard. And of you that. would lick oh, the yes. stick. Then you would lick it after you, you lick the stick, it. dip it, right. lick the stick, and it was just sugar on sugar. Yeah, it was like pixie sticks, right? Same well, thing. Straight in sugar. Yeah. Straight sugar. Yeah, have some sugar. Yeah. There was a product years ago, a cereal called Sugar Pop, <laughs> for years, and then and then when the whole sugar thing became a big negative, didn't make they it. changed it to um, something pop. They took the sugar Sucrose. out of it, <laughs> but there was still sugar in it. They just marketing just changed the name of the cereal. Lickamade yeah. is now called Fun Dip. Fun dip. That's those things. Oh, fun dip. Yeah. yeah, but but they provide you with a a stick made out of sugar to dip in sugar to eat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the th the things that, that, that we ate, the things that we did. Yeah. It's like riding in the back of a pickup truck in the old days. No seatbelts. Just yeah. you know, back of a pickup, drinking water out of the hose. Yep. We survived. <laughs> survived all those things. Lickamade uh, started in the 40s in the U.S. and Canada and then turned into Fun Dip. All right. Look at that. Made it into something even worse for you. Rather the than just licking your hand. Main ingredient? Sugar. Sugar. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It was manufactured by a company called Fruzola. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't well, that like any, any product you buy and you look at the ingredients? If the, the first ingredient isn't is that, the like, most. the most of it what's It always in there. goes, here's the most, and then everything after to that is in sequence. Yeah. yeah. So if it starts off with sugar, oh, it's there you the, go. Yeah, it's the most that's in there. Anyway, this follows my conversation about what I was going to plant. <laughs> oh, yeah? You're going <laughs> to plant some sugar? No, I don't know how we got off on this topic, but uh, I'm, I'm going to plant It's our last segment. This is those, up for grabs, this okay, segment. Okay, those fruit trees, and then I'm going to plant some Ulstermeria. And a few plants that I've... I've just been growing in pots, just waiting for openings in the ground. And so I have a couple heliotrope mm -hmm. that I'm going to put in. And then I got... Fragrant varieties or no? Yes. Nice. Yeah. One is the white one. Oh, great. Which kind of smells like a strong vanilla, right? Yep. Yep. Very strong. I like mm -hmm. vanilla or the white heliotrope because they're perennials. Mm -hmm. To me, they, it seems like they last longer than the purple ones. And then I mentioned the Alstroemeria, and then I've got some uh, Uriops, oh. and, and then an Agapanthus that our buddy Ping Lim gave me, okay. which is a new one called Atomic Bloom. Ooh. You're nothing but a Uriop. <laughs> take, take these names and go to s a layperson, right? I am not a Uriop. It's interesting because it's got to be some unique Uriop, because U Uriop, there's not a unique, Uriops are it's not actually, unique. Well, I think Uriops are also like thrips. There's not you can't have one. It's not a Uriop. It's Uriops. Ops. Oh, okay. It's like not like moose where there's a lot of them. Like if you have one thrips, you have one thrips. There's no <laughs> such yeah. thing as a thrip. Because because the name in itself is plural, but it designates itself as being singular. 
I'm, I'm not sure what you just said, but it's you woke. said it with authority, and I, <laughs> right. I, and I believe it. <laughs> so it has an S, but it's singular. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's like it's like moose. You have one moose, and you have a lot of moose, right? You don't have meese. <laughs> true. You know, it's a moose. Very true. Look at the moose. Who you used to say, I hate hate meeses to pieces? That was um, Snagglepuss? No, that was uh, Jinx the Cat. Jinx Pixie the and cat? Pixie and Dixie. And Jinx the Cat used to chase him around. And he would say, I hate meeses to pieces. I hate meeses pieces. to pieces. Yeah. <laughs> Big Hanna-Barbera guy. Patty uh, in San Marcos says she remembers with an exclamation point. Uh, I'm not sure what she remembers, but I'm thinking it's like a maid. <laughs> well, you've, you've taken us down memory lane, John. There are a lot of things, I think, that uh, people remember. You know, the older I get, the more I remember, and I sometimes I find out it actually never happened. <laughs> hey, we have one minute to go, guys. Last thoughts. Last, uh, do we know? Oh, no, no, no show next week. No, what? no, the week after. Oh, is it the week after? Yeah, I'm uh, off the 18th. Oh, so we need a guest next week, Tiger. We yeah. We do, because, no, I had. We'll figure it okay. out. Okay, yes. Yeah, two weeks, I'm out. 18th. 18th. No show. So we'll figure out a guest next week. John, you could stay home and call the show. We're talking with John Bedrasco. <laughs> I'll be happy to. We yeah. substituted his I coffee with Folgers Christian. I just found out how easy it is to do that. Okay, guys, so that's it. Kevin uh, good says show? beekeeping. We've done beekeeping shows before. Yeah, yeah we, we can do. talk about uh, bees I, some I, more. I know a few people. We can definitely get a beekeeping okay. show going. Thank you, Kevin. Good, uh, good suggestion. Well, thank you, all of those who have tuned in this morning. Be at Biz Talk Radio. Visit to Facebook. Uh, be at Facebook Live. Uh, we thank you so much for supporting our show and being right with us every weekend. Have yourself a great rest of your weekend, a safe weekend. We'll do it again next week. We are not off next week. It's the following weekend, Saturday the 18th. So enjoy your weekend and uh, join us again next weekend right here on Garden America. Brian Maine, Tiger Palafox, John Bagnesco.